I'm just going to give it another minute or two to see if well shows up. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, let me start up my Camtasia recording here. Hello. There it is. Okay. And down there. Check, check, testing. That looks like that's good. Can everybody hear me okay? Good, good. Got thumbs up. Okay. <clears throat> so welcome to week three. Any questions on anything before we start up here? Nothing? Okay. Well, let me go ahead and switch over to there. And let's start talking about object-oriented programming. Um, so I'm going to assume that probably most of you have seen object-oriented programming before. I'm going to go through things fairly quickly. You're probably going to get some details out of this that you may not have realized from some of what you've seen in the past. Um, hopefully, you'll come out with a better understanding of some concepts. Um, and uh, you know, then we can use these in our wonderful Kotlin language here. So the first thing I want to talk about are the three main tenets of object-oriented programming. Can anybody tell me what the three main tenets of object-oriented programming are? There are three of them. And you can either speak out or make a chat or whatever you'd like. Everybody's muted, muted by the way right now. Encapsulation, inheritance, and something else. Abstractio. Ooh, that sounds like a villain. Uh, that would be like a Spider-Man villain. I like that one. Um, so we had encapsulation, inheritance, and there's one more. Can anybody remember the third one? Starts with a P. Polymorphism. There we go. So polymorphism. So let's talk about these three things here. Um, what what are your opinions on encapsulation? What does that mean to you? 
What does encapsulation mean? Any ideas? Hiding implementation details. That's one way to look at it. Um, not my preferred way to look at it. I prefer to tweak that just slightly to protecting implementation details. And there's really kind of two main schools of thought on how you encapsulate things. Um, one school of thought follows something they call the law of Demeter. And what the law of Demeter says is that you should protect everything completely. Everything should be hidden um, unless you explicitly want to show it to somebody else. Um, and so your implementation details are all hidden. And then you provide getters and setters just piecemeal for the things that you want to expose. Um, the other school of thought is much more open. And that's really kind of where I sit. And the idea is that you want to make sure that people can't indiscriminately change your data. But there really isn't a problem with exposing everything and letting people override things, letting people extend your classes uh, very easily. Um, with one exception, if you explicitly want to make sure something can't be overridden or extended, then protect it that way. You can hide the details it that way. And um, the, the big difference on this is that when you go with the extensible approach, if you write a library that has very extendable classes and somebody else is using it, if they find something they need to tweak, they can tweak it. Um, and I've had a pretty mixed bag with this with using third-party libraries. Sometimes I can override their implementations. Sometimes I can't. Sometimes they protect everything so much that I basically have to abandon the library or go back and get the source code and make a fork of it so that I can make some tweaks. And that's kind of unfortunate. And I've actually had this even happen with uh, some of the, uh, the implementations of some common libraries like Swing or uh, some of the, uh, the view implementations in Android. And you know, every once in a while, there'll be one little detail that they might not get quite right, or it might not be flexible enough to do something that you really need to do. And then you end up having to basically implement the whole thing over again. And that's not too fun. Uh, so if you take the approach of hide it when you have to, so, if, and that mainly applies for security type things. So, you know, you, you don't want to like let somebody say, hey, let me get a password. You don't want to do that. Uh, but if you let things be extensible and make sure that you're just using your own API to access them rather than just the, you know, little nitty gritty implementation details under the covers, then things should work out just fine. Now, with a language like Java, when you define private variables and then public methods to expose them, the problem there is that a lot of times inside of your class, people directly use those variables. And what ends up happening is if your getters and setters have any side effects, you miss those side effects when you're actually making the calls inside the class. And that can be a real big problem. One of the really great things about a language like Kotlin, when you declare a property, it's always going through the getters and setters, no matter if you're calling inside the, the class or outside of the class. And that way, if there's extra side effects that you need to do, like let's say um, when uh, you set a variable, it's going to talk to some uh, classes who are listening to it. That'll take case either if you're inside the class or outside the class. And we'll get into some more details about that along the way. Um, but this is one of the reasons why I really don't like a couple of the defaults in Kotlin where they make everything final. And uh, the, the problem there is if you want to extend something, you've got to, or if you want to make something extensible, you have to remember to declare it as open. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let me talk about this protecting implementation details a minute and give you kind of like my little uh, two minute speech on where encapsulation comes from. So several years ago, I was uh, visiting Europe, I was teaching a class in the UK. And uh, after the class, on the weekend, I decided to, to go and do some sightseeing in London. So I went into to Harrods to get uh, some kind of a little knickknack for my wife at the time. And going into the place, there's this long line of people just this kind of people funneling into the door and everybody's kind of walk, walking like penguins because they're all right next to each other. You get inside, did my shopping, paid for it. And on the way out, it's very similar. There's this wad of people just trying to kind of funnel out the door and there's just people bouncing off each other all over the place. So um, after I got done shopping, 
I was hungry. So I decided to go to McDonald's. Now, of course, you're like, why are you going to McDonald's in, in London? There's plenty of other good places to eat. Um, that's because London has fried apple pies at their McDonald's. You can't get those anymore here. And when I was a kid, I loved the fried apple pies at McDonald's. So I wanted fried apple pies when I heard they had them. So I go and I order a Big Mac and fries and two apple pies and a Diet Coke, not because I was dieting, but because I like my teeth. And go to reach for my wallet to pull it out to pay. And my wallet's not there. This was a big problem because here I am salivating over these, these fried apple pies and I couldn't eat them. So I had to say, I'm sorry, you know, my wallet's been stolen. <laughs> and uh, so then I had to deal with actually getting, you know, getting a new wallet and all the, the driver's license and everything. So it was a big hassle. The biggest problem in this scenario was that at some point along the line, my state changed and I wasn't aware of it. If I had known I didn't have my wallet, I wouldn't have gone into the McDonald's and ordered my stuff and start salivating over my fried apple pies. Um, unfortunately, somebody was able to just reach into my back pocket. And uh, if I were in a live class right now, I'd stand up and show you that I keep my wallet in my front pocket now because of this. It's a lot harder for somebody to get it. Uh, somebody reached into my pocket and took it, and I didn't know. Now, if instead, if I'm protecting my data, protecting my state that says I have a wallet, you know, maybe I even go the extra mile of putting my hand in my pocket so that you know I'm holding on to my wallet so somebody really can't take it. Then people have to ask me to get my wallet. And they can say, hey, give me your wallet. And I can say no. I can say, nope, don't want to give it to you. If the, the, uh, uh, the call was parameterized, like maybe they're holding a knife or holding a gun or something, maybe I would say, OK, here you go. But in either scenario, I know my state. And this is really key. If you don't know your internal details or if your internal details can change without you knowing about it, then you can get all sorts of inconsistencies inside. You know, like when I went to McDonald's, it was my mind was inconsistent because I thought I had a wallet. Um, so it's really important to be able to hide and protect your data. Um, hiding, you can do if you really don't want to expose it. But for the most part, I would say protect it. Make sure that people from the outside can't grab your data or change your data without you knowing. And being able to know is just the ability to override your getters and setters. So when we're defining things in Kotlin inside of a class, we can define a, a var, we can define a val. If we want to, we can override the getter or the setter. So that gives us the ability to know if we need to know when something changes and gives us the ability to say, if one property changes, make sure that the rest of my state is in sync with it. So that's really kind of the key importance of encapsulation there. Um, another little example that I like to give is a peanut butter jar. If you want to try to implement a peanut butter jar and you're not protecting your data properly, you know, if we were doing a, a peanut butter example using just functions, we might have out here a var peanut butter amount, oops, Whoa, my fingers are working real well today. We'll start off at 32 ounces. And then we might have a function over here that says spread peanut butter and maybe an amount that we're going to spread. And then in there, we'll just say peanut butter amount minus equals amount, something like that. And you know, this is all well and good. You know, Everybody can call this function or, you know, hey, this is a global variable here. Somebody could just go ahead and say peanut butter amount minus equals 20, whatever. Um, the big problem we have with this is unless we're protecting this, somebody could make that value go too large or too small. We could go into negative peanut butter. And I want to caution everybody about negative peanut butter because if you have anti-peanut butter on one slice of bread and peanut butter on the other slice of bread and you put them together, universe as we know it is gone. So don't do that. You want to protect this. So we'd put this inside of a class and make sure that we can stop people from taking too much. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. I'll show you, you know, kind of a more object-oriented version of the peanut butter and all that type of thing. Let's talk about inheritance. What is inheritance? And remember, do not use the word in the definition. Any thoughts on what inheritance is?
well, I guess it's my turn to say something then. So um, inheritance means that you can take a base definition of something and subclass it, create a, a, um, another type of it by grabbing all the same data from that superclass. It becomes part of your definition and then you can add to it and you can tweak it. So it allows you to change things. It allows you to specialize things. And the easiest way to think of, of any type of inheritance hierarchy is uh, you know, the, the natural world for biology. We have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And I always like to say that because it's about the only thing I remember from biology. And it just further makes things more and more specific the farther down the tree you go. You start off with something very, very general like the animal kingdom, and then you can derive it further and further to get to like a mammal, which describes certain subsets of mammals, of animals. And then you can derive that further into specific types of mammals, like a cat or a dog or a platypus or something like that. And inheritance helps you not have to constantly redefine the same things over and over again. All the common functionality gets carried down from a superclass, so the, the generalization, like animal, he might have some, some general pieces of information there, like the fact that an animal is a living creature. And when we start going to our, der our derivations, our specializations, we also know, hey, because I am a, an animal, I am going to also know that I'm living. And then as you go down a little further, you know, mammal, it has fur. It does live birth in most circumstances. And then each, in, each specific specialization of it, boy, that's a weird combination there, specific specialization, like a cat or a dog, we know that cats and dogs are furry and give live birth. But sometimes you need to tweak things a little bit. A platypus and echidna, for example, these two suckers lay eggs. And they're very, very strange creatures. Uh, if you've ever seen a platypus in person, if you've seen a picture of a platypus, you think it's weird to start with, but when you see one in person, it really blows your mind that this thing is actually real. I mean, you really kind of think it's like a jackalope where somebody taxidermed things together when you see a picture. When you see it moving around, it's like, that, that's just wrong. Um, but the thing about a platypus and an echidna is they lay eggs. That's how they, they uh, uh, reproduce. They don't give live birth. So we have to tweak some details. So most of their characteristics, they're mammals, but we might tweak a few things here and there. So we can, um, let's see, create specializations. Of types to add or extend, replace behavior. Something kind of like that. Now polymorphism. The one that most of the time people forget about. Um, anyone know what it means? Polymorphism. If we look at the, the word itself, it literally means many forms. If you take that from the Greek. And what we're trying to do is say that I might have different ways of doing the same thing. In specific, in our programming languages, this is going to be overloading functions or methods, depending on the language you're dealing with. Some languages call the behavior inside of a class a method. Some of it call it, some call it a function. In Kotlin, we're gonna call it a function because everything's functional. Um, in Java, you typically call it a method. Now, what overloading means is you have the same name, but different parameter types. So the, the name of the function looks the same. But the parameter types are different. And what's really nice about polymorphism is that um, the, uh, uh, let's see if I can say the right thing here. Um, if you didn't have this capability to overload functions, uh, you would have to have a different function name for every single function. Think about what that would be like if you had to have some kind of a list and you wanted to do, let's say that you had a, uh, 
list class here for some reason. And then inside here, you had a fun add taking in a, I'll just call it a, a number, make it an int. Whoops. But let's say that we also wanted to have adding a number at a specific position. We would have to have a completely different name for it. So add at position. And what's really weird about this concept is that every time you add a different version of this ad, you're increasing your namespace. You're increasing the surface area of your API. So now when somebody's programming this, they have to know many more words. If, and let's say there was another one here, so add at end, something like that. Well, that's not really going to be helpful. Um, add protected. Let's say that we're going to wrap it inside something else. I don't know what I'm going to do here. Um, oh, add multiple. Let's do that. So we'd have a var arg number. So you can actually add multiple numbers at the same time. Um, all of these, each of these, each time we add one of these, let's come up with a whole new name. And that kind of sucks. So instead, one of the pieces of polymorphism is allowing you to overload things. So instead of having these three functions be called that, we're just going to have all of them called add. So the function itself is a combination of the name of the function and the parameter types. Those two pieces, name plus parameter types, is called a signature of the function. And that makes each function unique. So we'll know which function we actually intend to call based on what we're passing to it. And that's just as good as if we had a unique name on these. Now, if you have the same parameter types, obviously you're going to have to have different uh, par different method names on this or different function names. Um, so you know, sometimes you will have some different ones. But fortunately, this is one of the things we can do with polymorphism is overload things so that we give them different names. So this is overloading function names. Now there's another feature with polymorphism that makes things even more interesting, but at the same time, it can be quite difficult to think about. And that is overriding functions or methods. Hold on one second, I gotta turn an alarm off over here. There we go. Uh, so overriding functions and methods allows you to uh, give a different behavior to something. So in a subclass, same signature, different behavior. And the way that polymorphism factors into this is that we figure out based on the type of the object we're talking to, which one of these functions we want to talk to. So if we had a class A with a fun foo and a class B with a fun foo and B extends A, note that I have a couple things I have to deal with here cleaning up wise to start with. A here, if I float over, it's going to say has a constructor. You can't, you have to actually initialize it there. And what's nice about constructors in Kotlin, as we'll see, is that you can just define them right in line while you're defining these things. However, there's one other problem here if I float over it. Type is final, so it cannot be inherited from. That's that default. When I don't explicitly say anything in front of class here, I can't extend the class. I can't make a subclass out of it. So I'm going to change that to be an open class so that I can explicitly make a subclass of it. So I have this little hierarchy. Class A is our superclass. Class B is our subclass. And then I have two functions here. It's the same function name, same parameters. So it has the same signature. I'm overriding this foo function in the subclass. 
And in order to do that, if I float over him, he's going to say foo hides a member. You need the override modifier. So if I hit Alt Enter on him, I can add that override. And what this keyword does for me is it says, I meant to do that. So when the compiler is looking at your code, it's very possible that I'm creating a subclass here and I accidentally over overrode a function here. So I accidentally right. typed in a brand new function with the exact same signature. This happens a good bit. And having this override function forced in our face, it's our way of telling the compiler, yes, indeed, I meant to override that. If you don't have override, the compiler tells you, whoa, wait, you're accidentally overriding something. If you really meant to, throw that override on there for me. And then we have the same issue here with openness. If I float over override, it'll say it's final and cannot be overridden. So again, with this function, I have to make the function open as well. Now, when I define something like this, depending on what object I have, if I have an instance of an A and I call foo on it, it's gonna call that foo right there. If I have an instance of a B and call foo on it, it's gonna call that foo right there. And we'll see some examples of this in a little bit. I'm gonna go through a pretty detailed scenario on how all this overriding and uh, polymorphism works. Um, that's generally how things work. Now there's a few little weirdness here and there that we have to be aware of. And a couple things that don't necessarily work how you might think they work. Um, but for the most part, think about this right now for polymorphism, we can overload functions and we can override them. Now, when you have an overridden function, sometimes you want to call that superclass behavior. And so you can just call super.foo inside there if you want to. And then that will end up calling this one just in line at that spot. So let's say, for example, that this foo took a parameter here. Let's say n is an integer. And maybe this is going to print lin n, something like that. And then down here, I'm gonna override him. Note that it's now saying that this is no longer an override because the signatures are different. If I put int in there, now it's gonna say, okay, yep, that's a valid override. Let's say that when I have an instance of B, I wanna tweak that N. So I might change the N going in, change the parameter going in, or if there's a return code, I might change the return value coming out of that function. Um, that's generally what you're gonna use overriding for, is to do a little bit of a tweak. Sometimes you're gonna override just to do some logging or just to do some reporting or change some other variable somewhere. Uh, so uh, you know, it gives you a place to do that by tweaking this in a subclass. Okay, any questions so far? Hopefully most of this sounds pretty familiar. Anything, any questions? Okay, so let's start going into some details of what you can do inside of a class. So I'm gonna create a new file in here, call it properties. It's gonna be my properties thing here. And let's, let's go ahead and create a class called person. I'm gonna say class person. Um, normally I would wanna put open on there so that somebody can override that automatically. And um, I'm thinking I've got to write some kind of plug in here to automatically add open to everything unless I explicitly say final. Because uh, you can say final in there. And final is generally, a, well, you can't say it when it's open. Um, you can say final, but you'll see here that it's gray because that's the default. Um, but I'd kind of like to have a little uh, function that I could run against all my code and make everything open automatically. Um, that way it's much more extensible and flexible because I'm constantly forgetting to add open to this, but it's something that's a good idea to add into there. So let's say this is our class person. And what we're doing when we create a class is we're really creating a blueprint for chunks of memory that we're gonna carve out. And we're gonna call those chunks of memory object instances. So use this to create instances of a person. And there'll be multiple of those instances flying around. Now, this, this particular class right now isn't terribly useful. It doesn't have any data inside of it. So I could put some data inside it. Let's go ahead and add in 
a var name string and a var age int. And we'll notice that because we're defining these variables here and not overriding the getter and setter so that they don't use the field, these are going to have backing properties, sorry, backing fields. And because of those backing fields, we have to initialize them. So in this case, I'm going to just use an empty string there and use a zero for the age. So that gives me my general data I can work with. Let's create a main here. And in my main, I can say, let's create a person. And creating a person in Kotlin is a little easier than creating it in Java. In Java, I would have to say person, person equals new person. How redundant is that? In Kotlin, I can just say val person equals person. Note that I do not need a new keyword and I don't need to specify the type of the person because of our type inferencing. Now I could if I wanted to, I could do that. That'd be perfectly fine. But in many cases, you don't need to do that. The only time you're gonna wanna do that is if you have a variable that you want to explicitly treat as another type from the compiler's standpoint. So let's say, for example, that I had a superclass of this person, and I'll call it open class mammal. And person is going to extend mammal just like that. By doing this, if I change this to say mammal, and let's call this mammal, I'm explicitly saying that this variable can hold any type of mammal, but for right now, it's holding a person. So you're going to have to do this once in a while if you care about the actual variable being a uh, more generalized type, like a mammal. Um, otherwise, if I said mammal equals person, then you can only ever assign persons to mammals because right now you've declared it as a person. And so that's going to get in the way there if you're, if you're not close or if you're, if I just read the, I saw the LOL close on the abstractio and uh, it's wonderful how the mind does that. I see a word and I'm like, oh, it's not close. No, um, if you don't explicitly declare it as mammal, then it's going to be a person and you can only assign a person to it. So in a case like that, you would want to explicitly make sure that that variable can hold more things if you care about holding more things. If all you cared about holding people, then fine, define it as person. So let's pretend I hadn't done that for the moment. And I'm gonna come back here and say var person equals person, boom. Much tighter syntax there, much simpler to do. And then I can say person dot name equals Scott and person dot age equals 55. I'm so used to typing 54, but I December, I just turned 55. I can now go to the value menu at restaurants. Ooh. Um, this allows us to change the data inside of there. The dot notation is how you access these properties. So I'm going to go to my person. I'm going to follow his pointer to the name. Name is pointing to a string object. Age is pointing to that int object. And then I'm going to set that property. Similar with the age, I'm going to go to my person, follow his pointer to get the age or to set the age and set it to 55. Now note here that it's saying variable is never modified, so it can be declared using val. And I strongly recommend that anytime you can declare something as a val. And most of the time, you're gonna have tons and tons of vals and never need to actually change the, vari change the value of the, uh, the, the property itself. So if we change this to a val, this person, variable is always going to be pointing to the same person object. You can never change where that variable points. So when I reference person, I follow the pointer to that person object that I created, go to his name object, and then change the value. Any questions on that? Now, if I want to print these things out, I can just say person.name and person.age. Boom, again, follow the person pointer to the person object, follow the name pointer from him to that string, get the string and print it out. So these are getting 
the values. These are setting the values. The setters are called when the property is referenced on the left-hand side of an equals. Okay, so that allows me now to create an object and send some data in there. There's a little bit of an issue here. We're starting off with some default values and maybe those default values just don't make sense. Maybe it doesn't make sense to ever have a person that has a blank name and a zero as an age. Maybe you wanna make sure that when somebody creates a person, they pass that data to you so that uh, the data will be there for sure. Let's create a, a second person class here. And what I'm gonna do is set up a constructor for him to set up this data for us. Now, the way that I'm gonna write it right now is not how I'd want you to write this in Kotlin. It'll work, but there's a much, much nicer way to do this. But this kind of steps us through getting to that way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a constructor up here that takes a name string and an age int. We're defining this constructor inline here. I just realized I never started my Camtasia recording. So I will be using the recording from uh, Blackboard or from Zoom, which is nice. That's why I do them in both places. I just forgot to hit that record button. I'm gonna go ahead and kill this because I just noticed this little drag symbol here. I'm like, oh shoot. So I'm gonna close that. That way it's just out of the way. Um, sorry about that, but uh, you will still get a good video out of this because uh, Zoom does a good job of capturing this. So now we've created a constructor definition in line with the class definition. This is what's called a primary constructor in Kotlin. And right now this will allow us, in fact, it'll actually force us to pass a name and an age in. But if I float over name here, Parameter name is never used. Float over age, parameter age is never used. So I got to do something explicitly to use that. And the way I do that is by creating an init block. And this acts as a constructor body for you. And I can use this to do my initialization. So I can say, change the person's name to the name that was passed in. Change the person's age to the age that was passed in. Now, because they have the same names, I can't just say the name of the person equals the name from the constructor body. That won't work because when I do this, if you float over this, it's gonna say val cannot be resigned because up here, all the parameters are values. They're not variables. You can't change the values of parameters. So I need some way to disambiguate this. Now I could do something like this. Just give different parameter names from the actual names of the types inside the, the names of the fields in the class. And so I could say age equals age x. And that would work. But now again, we're expanding the surface area of the variable names in our, in our, in our, uh, our file here. So there's more names for me to have to juggle in my head. I would much rather keep them as name. We can do that by explicitly saying which name we care about over here. And we do that by saying this dot in front. And what that means is it means, take a look at the object that I'm creating right now. That's called this. Anytime you mention this inside the body of, of a person, it's talking about the object itself, that instance of the person that we've created. So we're gonna take and change the instance's name to the name being passed in, change the instance's age to the age being passed in. Okay, so let's take a look at creating this person two. And I can say person two equals person two. And if I try to do that, it's gonna give me an error because I haven't passed the values into the constructor. So what I'm gonna do is pass in Scott and 55 as the values. And now, if I try to print these out, that should work. Oh, come on, fingers. Wasn't letting me type. Let's put some dashes in there. 
Let's go ahead and run this guy and see what he looks like. So we got the Scott and 55 from this one up here and the Scott and 55 down here. Let me drag him over into there. Okay, so um, do you need to keep the initialization of variable name string equals when using the init block? Um, so the question here, do I need to keep these initializers? And in this case, I do because these are separate steps. When we're first creating these properties, it has to have some value for that backing field. And so we have to give it a backing field in the initializers here. Um, when we're using initializer block here, we're now gonna set up the name and the age. Now, actually, I think, let me, let me walk that back again. I think if I do this, it'll actually be okay now. Yeah, so if every possible path through construction will set these, then you don't need to explicitly implement those. So yeah, good question there. Um, and I, I don't do things this way very often in Kotlin because there's a much better way to do it. Uh, so this is something that I hadn't noticed before, but yeah, this is a good way to do it. We can just say, you don't need these because we're guaranteeing in this initializer block that the name and the age are actually going to get set. So thank you for asking that. Okay, so don't write code like this though. But this is one way that you can set up the values inside there. It's very, very wordy though. And this is a lot closer to what you do in Java, where if I came in here with a Java class, I'll call it Java person. Then inside here, I might have a private string name and a private int age, and then a public Java person taking a string name and an int age, and then a this.name equals name, this, oops, dot age equals age. I totally should have done this using the generator. And then I'm going to right click and say generate. See, I could have generated constructors there. I'm going to go ahead and generate the getters and setters for name and age. Boom. So what we have here, this Java person is equivalent to the thing that we just wrote, that person two, where he has a constructor coming in. That's the only constructor defined. So when somebody creates this Java person instance, they'd have to pass in the name and the age as well. We assign them and then we can get them and set them. The getters and setters are taken care of by the fact that these are vars. It's automatically defined. So I don't have to define those, those general ones. Um, okay, let's see, why did that say, I just got a little notification saying that people can just see my screen. Can everybody see everything okay here? Can you see uh, the IntelliJ? Okay, good. Um, that I mean, did it go away at some point, or did uh, did it switch to something else? I guess not, because um, it just I just got a little note from Zoom saying that participants can now see the screen. So I'm not sure what that was all about. Um, okay, so any questions on this guy right now? Now, fortunately, there's a nice shorthand here because <clears throat> I really like the shorthands. So I'm going to say open class person three var name colon string and var whoops age colon int. And there we go. We're done. How's that? Talk about some reduction of code there. If in your primary constructor, you actually define properties using var or val, it defines those properties for the class. So it's exactly the same as doing this right here. It takes care of assigning the values to those, it sets up the properties, really, really nice. Now the disadvantage here, this is primary constructor defining properties. Now, the, the one problem here is note, cannot override, get, or set. If you do things that way, you can't override the getters and setters for those properties. Um, and that's a little unfortunate. Um, it could be really gross to read, I think, if they let you. Um, but if you do need to override the getters and setters, then you will need to resort to this type of behavior here in the from the person too. So if I come down here and do this again, 
for person three. And let me just go with, I'll call this Mike and, and we'll make him 30. And now if I run this, I should see that Mike object come up there. That's pretty darn nice. I really like that. Now what happens if instead of saying print person age and print person name, what if I just said print person? Let's see what happens. That's pretty ugly. What ends up happening is if you try to print something directly, it's going to call to string on that object. And that's a function defined by the object. And by default, default that's uh, set for any type of object, it's going to print out the name of the class. So this is actually the fully qualified name because we're in package OO up here. So it's OO.person3 is the name of our class. And then it's going to give you an identifier for that actual object. Um, this is actually a hash code for the object that just represents an identifier of it. Um, and this can be fairly useful for debugging, uh, but you probably want more. You probably want to actually see the data that's inside of that object. Uh, by, you know, this, this printout here isn't really giving us a whole lot. Now keep in mind, to string should be used for debugging only. You don't want to use this for actually representing data to the user. So putting it out in the user interface, putting it through a command line, writing a report, putting an HTML, you don't want to use toString on this. Uh, you want to have something else format it nicely for the way that you want to display it. And the reason for this is that this object really doesn't know how you're going to be using it. He doesn't know how you want to print it on the screen, how you want to display data, how you want to uh, represent things in a report or in a spreadsheet. That should all be a mechanism of the way that you're writing the data, not the data itself. So don't use toString for anything other than debugging. That said, let's see how we can actually make this toString a little nicer. So I'm going to come into here. Um, did somebody have a question? I thought I heard something. Nope, I guess not. Okay. Um, so let's create a person four. And what I'm going to do is add some functions inside of here. I'm going to right click and say generate to string. And I'm going to pick name and age, hit OK. And now I get this lovely little to string function. Notice that it's overridden. The super class of all classes. It's called any in Kotlin. In Java, it's called object. But in Kotlin, it's called any. And in the any class, it defines the default to string, which does this, this implementation that we saw over here. By overriding it, we can change that behavior. This is a pretty common format of what you might want to uh, write for a to string. Have the class name, open paren, and then the property list, just so people can actually see what the data is. Now, by doing this, if I come in here and change this to a person four, I'm going to get rid of those. I change this to just say person four. Let's run that, see what it looks like. We see that now this says person four, name Mike, age 30. So that's actually pretty useful for debugging. And whether you're in the debugger and actually looking at the value of something or whether you're just printing it to a log, that's a pretty inf pretty useful uh, implementation there. And we got that you know, automatically generated for us. And there's a couple other types of functions like this that we may want to override that can be really, really important. And those are equals and hash code. So if I say generate equals and hash code, you always want to implement these together. They have to be consistent with each other. And supplies the parameters. Um, okay, so what it's asking here for this question is when you're looking at equality, do they have to be two objects of the same type? So they both have to be two people, or is it okay 
for things to potentially be equal if it's a, a class and a superclass instance or, or class and a subclass instance. So something like a person and maybe you created a subclass called doctor. Um, most of the time you're gonna want them to be the same type. So I'm not gonna check that box there. I'm gonna hit next. These variables are what's going to be to be important about this object being two objects being equal. So what we're saying is if two people have the same name and the same age, we're considering considering them logically equal. So you could basically use one for the other. Now you may want to have more information like an ID for the person, maybe a social security number. Um, and then maybe the social security number is the only thing that makes the person unique. And you don't care about the names and the ages. Um, but in this case, we're just going to say two people are considered equal if their name and their age are the same. I'll say next. And same thing for hash code. Boom. So let's take a look at this equals function here, first of all. So this first line here is saying if the current object is the same instance as the other, this three equals means the same instance. So the actual same instance in memory. Then return true, I'm done. Yeah. If my class is not the same as the class of the other guy, and in this case, we're using Java class. Uh, this only works if you're compiling for Kotlin JVM. Uh, if you're compiling for Kotlin JS or Kotlin something else, this line wouldn't be the same. It would actually be using the normal Kotlin class there. But in this case, I'm saying, if my Java class and the other Java class are not the same, return false. So they have to be the same type there. Then what I'm gonna do is cast it. So I'm gonna say, okay, we know they're the same type. Let me cast him, whatever that other guy was, who's anything. The question mark means nullable. We're gonna talk about that a little later. I'm gonna take that other class and say, I know it's a person four. So other as person four is a cast. And what this is doing by itself isn't a whole lot, but we'll notice down here, these two others have kind of a little, little greenish box around them. That's saying that other has been smart cast if I float over it, it says smart cast a person four. Once I did this, the Kotlin compiler says, well, because other is a value, it can't possibly have any other value to it. So after this point, I know it's definitely a person four. Now, a lot of times you're gonna use this in an expression and assign it to something, but in this case, we're just saying cast it so that every other reference I say is gonna automatically be a smart cast. The compiler knows that it's actually a person four. And then we just compare these things. If the name's different, return false. If the age is different, returns false. If we get past this entire gauntlet, boom, return true. We know that the two objects represent the same thing. Any questions on that? And that's pretty similar to Java, if you've seen the, the equals in Java. Now, hash code. <clears throat> this guy is used in hash maps. So if we're trying to use a hash map data structure and we want to uh, be able to look things up, the most important thing is if two objects, two instances, I'll say, are equals, hash code must be the same. It's a really, really important thing. Now let's talk about what the hash code does for a minute. You may or may not be aware of the implementation of a hash map, or if you go back farther, we used to call it a hash table. Um, this is a data structure that's used for looking things up. You can look things up by key. And what you tend to do in a hash map, you'll have buckets of data. The whole idea is that we want to try to distribute the data into multiple buckets so that you don't have to search all of the data. We can just jump to a bucket and then look at the data in that bucket to try to find the piece of data that we're looking for. So we distribute data into bucket, hash code, mod, number of buckets. 
So if we have 10 buckets, we find that hash code, mod it by 10, and that just figures out which bucket we jump to. So when you're inserting, find a bucket, throw it in there. And in the bucket, it typically, whoops, typically have a list of items. And depending on the implementation, there may be different ways that they represent the items inside there, but typically you just throw them in a list. So you jump to the bucket you want and then walk that list to find the value that you're interested in. Um, when, you're in when you're inserting, you jump to there and insert, insert at the end of the list. Now the list might be sorted by uh, some kind of key, might not, depends on how you've implemented your, your hash map. But this is typically what you end up doing. Um, this ends up drastically uh, reducing your search space. So instead of having to search through huge amounts of data, you jump and you know search through it. So if you have 10 buckets, you now, if, you're, if your hash code is fairly well distributed, 10 buckets, you, you're dividing the search space into 10. Um, now, depending on the hash map implementation, you might have 1,000 buckets, you might have 32 buckets. Just depends on the implementation. And I can't remember off the top of my head how many there are by default. Let's take a look here. Let's say var x equals hash map. And I'm just gonna leave that not working. Um, is it saying here how many buckets we have? Looks like 16. Well, oh, it's not its capacity. Uh, load factor bin count. So it looks like, um, oh, they have, a, they're doing a whole lot more here, switching things into trees and every stuff. Um, I'd have to dig to find exactly how many buckets there are in there, but that's the general idea is we're defining buckets based on hash code. So it's really, really important that if two instances return true for equals, the hash code must be the same because what's gonna happen is you're gonna use that hash code to jump to the bucket and then use equals to compare the key as walking through there. Um, and so, you know, if, if the instances are, are, uh, are equal, um, if the instances are equal, the hash code must be equal. Okay, so in this case, we're just determining that based on the name and the age. Any questions on that? So always, always, always define both of those together. Now we're starting to get verbose again here. And we'll notice that when we generate this, it has a certain algorithm to how it generates it. Now, whenever that happens, Kotlin typically will have a nice short way of doing things. So rather than having to generate this code, Kotlin provides a way to let you uh, get this stuff automated. So let's take a look at how that looks. This was person four, right? Let's create a person five. I'm gonna now say data class person five with var name string and var age int. And boom, that's all I need. This gives me to string, a reasonable implementation of to string, hash code equals, and each of these defined for the parameters to the primary constructor. So each of these functions to string hash code and equals apply on name and age. And they're generated exactly the same as we just saw here. Um, this might look slightly different. Let's see what it takes a look at. It looks like when we actually run it. Let's try running that. So see that it looks slightly different. The implementation from the data class doesn't have the extra quotes around the string. You don't really need it though. Uh, still giving us the same kind of information. Plus it gives us that, that equals in the hash code. That's really, really nice. Now it also gives us a few extra things. Data classes are really, really nice. One of them is defines a copy. Actually, I'll just put this underneath here because it's for those parameters. With all parameters defaulted to current value. 
So let's see what that looks like. I could come down here and say val person 5a equals person 5 dot copy. And look at that it has this name and an age in here where the name is assigned to a value already and, it, and the age has a certain value. So if I just said copy and I want to change the name, I just use the name parameter. So in this case, it's going to change the name but keep the age. So if I come down here and say person 5a, we'll see that person 5a has name Steve and age 30. So any of the data that was in the con primary constructor is automatically copied to the new instance. These are two different instances. If I said println person 5 equal, 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 person 5a, I should get faults out of that. There we go, we get a false because they're actually two different variables. If I did something like this, just for the heck of it, val test one equals person five, and then said, is it equal, equal, equal to test one? Let's see what he comes up with. Boom, true. Because both of those variables, are, both those properties are pointing to the exact same instance. So we'll see here that this var variable is the same and can be inlined. He just knows that he's already tracking that same line. You're not going to use that one too often, but every once in a while, it's kind of nice, like in that implementation of equals, as we saw there. Okay. Now, there's a couple other interesting uh, um, functionality inside there. Let me just double check something here real quick. Because I always think I'm missing one, but there's one other one I want to talk about. Yeah, so I, I got them all. Um, there's one other type of function that it uh, creates for us. And so it will create a component one for first uh, parameter to constructor. Component two, component three. and so on. And what these little functions do is these allow us to do destructuring declarations. And a destructuring declaration in Kotlin looks like this. You have a parenthesized list of variable names. And then you assign it to a object that was defined by a data class. So person five, because he's defining a component one and component two, Component one gets assigned a name. Component two gets assigned to age. And so now I can print Lynn. Now let me actually call these name five and age five just in case. And when I run that, I see Mike and 30 as those two different things. Um, every once in a while, this is actually very useful. Uh, the main place I like to use something like this is if you need to return more than one value from a function. So you may define a data class just to allow you to group one or, or two or more values together as a result from a function. And then when you call that function, use the destructuring declaration to break apart the different values. So let's take a look at that real quick. If I came in here, well, I'll put them back up here, why not? Let's say that I had a function called um, generate next two numbers. I'll just add one to each of these things. And these numbers coming in here, this is going to return data class numbers val n1, val n2, something like that. And well, I can just do an equals on that. Equals numbers n plus 1, n plus 2, something kind of like that. And I can just infer that type. 
So this function is actually going to return this little helper object that's just wrapping these two guys for us. And then I can come down here and say val n1 n2 equals generate next two numbers. Maybe I'll say 15. And then when I print lend these guys, I should see 16 and 17 come up. And there we go. So this is kind of the most useful place where I've seen using a, a destructuring declaration. Uh, and you can also use that for an array. So if instead of this, if we had an array returning from that, That works. Yeah, so if you have an array, you can do that and it'll split the things out. This is particularly useful for if you wanna split up a string. Um, this is the most of the time that I've used it. So if I had like a val string equals a colon b colon c, and I wanted to split it up based on the colons, I could say, well, let's make it comma separated so it looks more like something you might do in real life. Don't do this, by the way, because uh, if you're going to try to parse comma separated va values in a CSV file, use a library that does it because there's some encodings that happen in there you have to take into account as well. Um, so because of that, I'm going to put colons in so you don't think you can do this. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'll just walk myself right back there. Be really careful. If you're trying to parse something like CSVs or XMLs, don't do it on your own. Use a library that's designed to do that because they're going to handle the edge cases. And there's a lot of edge cases when you're doing CSV parsing or XML parsing or JSON for that matter. Uh, so uh, let's say I want to split this up. I can say val, uh, let's see, letter one, whoops, letter two and letter three equals string dot split. passing in, actually, I just want to, I think I can just do that like that. And boom, now I have the individual parts of the string. And this could be really, really helpful. Let's try running that. We should get A, B, and C on separate lines. Boom, just like that. Uh, so once you start getting used to using destructuring declarations, you're going to see spots like this that uh, become very, very helpful. If a function returns multiple values or returns an array, you can split it out automatically. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, let's see. So we've seen what a data class can do. These are really, really super useful. However, you can't create a subclass of them. So if I wanted to say class doctor, extends person five, I can alt enter on him to add constructor parameters automatically. But then when I float over it, it's gonna say this type is final. Um, and then if I try to make it open, he'll say he's incompatible with data. So I had to go a little ways to actually show the actual error, but in this case it's saying, a data class can't be open. And the reason for that is because of these functions that are being defined. They would have to be completely defined differently inside the, the subclasses. And the subclass would have to be a type of data class. So that's one fallback on this or one uh, uh, problem with this. You cannot create subclasses. Just something to know. Um, but data classes in general, very, very, very useful and nice and simple to define. Just boom, write that and you're golden. Okay, questions on that? Okay, and so probably some constructors. Let's talk a little bit about alternate constructors for a moment. Uh, let's say that we had, um, well, before I do that, you can have, uh, default values on these as well, if you really wanted to. So I could make the name optional. So somebody could just pass in the age if they said uh, person five age equals. Um, depending on what you're trying to do, you might want to do that, you might not. In this example here, 
I probably don't want to have a person that doesn't have a name and doesn't have an age. So alternate constructors, let's take a look at something a little more complex. Let's say, um, I've got an example on my website. I just want to see what I used as the example before there. Yeah, not a great example, but um, if you take a look, I'm just going to go ahead and pull this one over here. Um, on my website, underneath articles, I have this from Java to Kotlin episode one. You got to start somewhere. I was going to have a whole series of these, and I've just been so busy. See, I haven't touched this since February of 2019. Three years old, but it's a great article, if I do say so myself. Um, but down at the bottom here, Sometimes you're going to have uh, things that you might want to have uh, groups of, um, how do I want to word this? Sometimes you're going to have a whole lot of op pro properties on an object, but you really only want to define them in groups. You don't want to define it so that uh, people can specify. How, I'm, see, I'm doing a really poor job of, doing, of, of wording this. Um, where's the example that I had here? So that's just a subclass there. Yeah, let's say that this, this is a really horrible, horrible location class that I'm defining here. But let's say that we define this one here. And for some reason, we have Latin lawn together with street, city, state, zip. And let's say that it really only made sense to define either lat lawn or street, city, state, zip. We didn't want to define them both together because you could derive one from the other. So what we can do here is instead of having this parameter, this definition, let's go over to our class or to our file. Oops. So instead of having this be the definition where somebody has to know, oh, I've got to specify Latin lawn together and then ignore these other ones, what we can do is we can set up alternate constructors that provide groups of parameters and make sure that those parameters are defined. So what I'm going to do is type in private constructor in front of the paren here. And what this does is this makes it so that nobody on the outside can call, uh, can actually create an instance of a location right now, because we made the constructor private, so it's only visible inside the class. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to define two constructors explicitly. I'm going to have one that takes a lat and what I could double, yeah, and a lawn, which is a double. And he is going to, was it this, this. You see, this is one of those features I don't do very often. Um, he is going to call the main, the primary constructor, passing in all the parameters. So I can pass in lat, lawn and then pass in some default values for everything else. Oops. There we go, something kind of like that. Or I can create a constructor that says street. Let's just do it this way. rid of the vowels on these. Street, city, state, zip. Oh, that's nice. They actually added something that can actually spell them all out at once. Um, and what this is going to do for us is from the outside, nobody can call the constructor that takes everything. They can only call these two constructors, which again, by default, are public. So they either have to pass in a lat and a lawn, or they pass in street, city, state, and zip. Now, again, this is not a, not a good design for a location. There are much better ways we can do things that I'll talk about later. Uh, but if we decided to implement it this way, this would allow us to force the user to either specify lat and lawn and nothing else, or street, city, state, zip and nothing else. 
it's not going to be too often you're going to define alternate constructors, but every once in a while you're going to have them. Most of the time it's sufficient to have a primary constructor and then some of the parameters might have default values, which allows people to omit them. So they'd be optional parameters. Any questions on that? Okay, I would strongly recommend you read through this article because I think I did a pretty good job going through a lot of how the properties work and uh, especially compared to Java, if you're used to Java um, and how you set up the inheritance. Um, don't worry about interfaces for the moment. I'm gonna talk about those in a little bit. And let's see, was there anything else in here? And it talks about backing fields like we already did. Um, what the constructors are, is there anything else in here I wanted to? Um, so calling superclass constructors, if we had, let's say that we defined a uh, open class mammal. Let's say that every mammal has a name. And then I'm defining my subclasses. When I define this, this is usually how I end up doing it when I define it. I type in the, the class name I'm defining, colon, the superclass. Note that there's an error there. The first error is that, there's, that this needs a constructor. So when I float over it, it says the type has a constructor and must be initialized here. Then what I'll do is hit Alt Enter and use this add constructor parameters from mammal string, which will automatically add parameters to the cat constructor and then call the super constructor in mammal, passing that name in. Really nice and simple there. Fairly useful. Is there anything else in here that I want to cover? Default values, name parameters we talked about. I think that's it that I wanted to cover in there. So that's good. I'm really glad I wrote that article because it, it gives me something to check on to make sure I'm covering some pretty important points and then students can go and look at it if you want to. Okay, any questions on anything we've talked about so far today? I should mention that my teaching philosophy is what I call teaching by drowning. I will you know, throw you guys in the deep end and there's a lot of water in there. And I don't expect that you come out of the course perfectly knowing every little detail. But my goal is to try to show you a lot of the corners that you wouldn't normally hear in a class so that later on when you need it, you'll suddenly say, hey, I think we covered that in class. And you can go back and look at your notes or look at the videos or whatever and hopefully find it. Um, and speaking of finding it, make sure when you're taking a look at the videos, you turn on the captions on YouTube. Um, and the captions, there'll actually be a little transcript box you can bring up and you can search it. So that if there's a certain part of a, of a lecture, you're like, huh, he talked about superclass constructors. You can type in superclass constructor. And most of the time, the translation that they do is pretty good. Um, I haven't gone through and actually perfected the transcriptions yet. I have to download those and walk through and edit them. Um, but they're usually about 80 to 90% accurate. And uh, especially on YouTube, they've done a great job with the the voice recognition. Um, so I strongly recommend you use that because that can really help you find data when, uh, or find parts of a lecture that you need to go back to. But um, yeah, it's like, you know, some classes, they'll go through things super, super slowly. And, you know, you'll know the five things they taught you really, really well. But there's so many other little corners that it's nice to know information about. I like to try to fill in as many of those as I can so that, you know, later on, you have that information accessible and you'll be a better programmer for it as far as I'm concerned. You know, you know, you know hey, you'll become as good as me once you learn everything I know. Um, any questions on anything? And hopefully you won't have the same uh, ego that I do. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and take 10 minutes. It's 8.41 right now. Let's say 8.51, we'll start back up and talk about some other things.
Okay, let's go ahead and start back up. Any questions before we move on? All right, so let's uh, talk a little bit about a couple other things before we move through here. Um, let's think about this mammal for a second that we have here. This mammal class, does it make sense to ever have an instance of a mammal? Because if you think about it in real life, there isn't just something called a mammal. It's nice for classification. You know, you can say that I have a bunch of different things that are mammals, but there isn't just a mammal sitting out there. So we never really want to create an instance of that. So what we can do is instead of calling it open here, we can call it abstract. And that means it's just a concept. It means it's something that should never ever be instantiated. And by marking it abstract, you can't instantiate it. So if somebody came in here and tried to say val mammal equals mammal with some name, and we float over, it's gonna say, oh, come on, float over it. Cannot create an instance of an abstract class. So that's all an abstract does, is it just flags it as something that you're not allowed to create an instance of. Now that can be forced in some situations. If I had a class that had an abstract function in it, something like that, that means that I'm not providing a definition of that function here, and it has to be provided by a subclass. So anybody who implements or extends foo is going to have to create an instance of, of the, uh, anybody who creates a subclass of foo one has to define that foo function. Now, because of that, this means that there's an implementation detail missing. And anytime you have any abstract functions or abstract variables, the class itself must be abstract. So if I float over this guy, it's gonna tell us that. You know, abstract function foo is in a non-abstract class. So if I alt enter on him, I can make foo one abstract, boom. So abstract in itself doesn't mean that it has any abstract properties or functions. It just means that you can't create an instance. But if you have abstract properties or functions, you must make the class abstract. So if I had like an abstract val name string and I don't want to actually implement that in foo, now a subclass of foo has to. So class sum foo subclass. And I have a choice on how I want to implement that. So if I define it like this, I can float over. It says it has a constructor because it's a class. So I'll put parentheses. But now if I float over this, it says he's not abstract and he doesn't implement the abstract functions. Now, if I made this, this subclass abstract, then I can still have those functions being left abstract. I don't have to define them, but I'm gonna go ahead and define them. So if I alt enter on it, I can implement the, the variable, uh, the value as a constructor parameter. That takes care of the name. Note the override here because it's defined in the superclass. I'm giving an implementation. I could define it here in the primary constructor, or I could define it actually inside the class itself. So if I wanted to, the other op option here, let's say some class one, subclass two. And then this guy, I'm gonna say implement members. I could just define him inside the function itself, just kind of like that. And you know, maybe I have that as a fixed value. Maybe it's you know based on the getter, however you want to define it. So now we also have to implement that foo function. Oops. So I can add that in. And I can do the same thing down here. Boom, just kind of like that. And so now these subclasses are, are perfectly fine we've filled in all the implementation details so they don't have to be abstract. Any questions on that? Class has abstract functions or properties. 
class must be abstract. And then that just carries on down the pipe. So that's kind of useful there. Now we can take this to an extreme. We can say that a class is completely abstract and maybe not even call it a class anymore. We can call it an interface. And let's say that I called this the Terminator. And he might have some functions say, I'll be back. And fun say, are you Sarah Connor? We can think about interfaces very similar to movie roles. These are things that some actor signs up to do. So he basically promises, I will say those lines. That's part of his job. Anybody who implements the Terminator could then be used in the Terminator uh, when they're filming Terminator. So I could create some classes here. Like I could have class Arnold, and he's going to be a Terminator. Now note that this is not a class, so I don't need to put parentheses there to give it a constructor call. But I do need to implement these functions. All functions by default are abstract, something kind of like that. And so inside here, I could implement the members and then define what that means. So I could say println I'll be Bach. And we could come down here, say, I use Sarah Connor. Something kind of like that. Um, and this is Arnold's particularly particular way of implementing this uh, this interface. Now, other classes could implement it differently. I mean, you could have a Peewee class where all he does is go ah, uh, or you could have you know a Shakespearean actor who says everything very very precisely, and they might not be the best choice for the role, but they could be used in the role because they're implementing that interface. Now, you can think of an interface kind of as a contract. It's a way of saying what a class must do. And then functions could just use the interface specification and be passed anything you want. So if I came in here and said function uh, terminator script, passing in a terminator. It's a very one-sided terminator script. It just has his lines. I can then have the terminator say I'll be back and say, are you Sarah Connor? And I could pass in anybody who's a terminator, a potential terminator there. Let's uh, go ahead and make a peewee here. And all he says is, ah! And so now we can use either one of those from our main here. So I could say, Terminator script passing in Peewee or pre passing in Arnold. And we end up getting the Peewee version, which is just yelling all the time, or we end up getting the Arnold version. And this is really nice when we start talking about how to uh, layer your application, having a domain layer that just talks abstractly about things. Most of it is going to be just interfaces. Um, you may have some classes that you translate from other things, but if your uh, your middle layer is mostly interfaces to define logically what you want to do rather than how to do it, it allows you to plug in different implementations and then it can actually uh, uh, make things a lot easier for you overall. Okay, any questions? A lot more flexible because you can pass in different implementations all over the place. Okay, questions? We're going to see a lot more of these in action throughout the course, too. Uh, so what I'd like to do is go into a little more detail on polymorphism, um, because a lot of times it's not super clear what's going on. And sometimes the implementations in different languages act a little bit differently. Now, Kotlin's behavior is very, very similar to, to Java's behavior. 
So, uh, you know, if you learn how uh, polymorphism works in one language, either Java or Kotlin, you pretty much know how it works in the other. But I'm going to go through some scenarios here to, to, to work with, you know, uh, how uh, polymorphism is actually working from a compiler standpoint and a runtime standpoint. And it's very important that you think of it from those two different standpoints, the compiler standpoint and the runtime standpoint. Um, the, uh, they, they actually are very, very different times to look at things. So let's take a look at, I'll create scenario one here. I'm gonna start off by saying interface tool. So I'm just gonna describe a tool. Now note that I'm not defining any properties. I'm not defining any, um, um, actually, before I talk about this, I do wanna talk about one other thing before I forget. So I'm gonna create one more file here and let's call this um, derived properties. So let's talk about derived properties really quickly. Um, Let's say that we had a data class person inside here, and he's going to have val name and val, let's just say first name and last name. And oh, I'm going to call him person42, so he's a unique name. Now in this class, let's say that I also want to have a name property, which is automatically going to be last name comma first name or first name last name. Let's say that I say um, name is just going to be first name last name. We'll keep it simple like that. I can actually define a name property kind of like this. There's a couple of things I could do with this. I could use an initializer. Because these are vowels, that means they can't change. So in this particular example, I could just say dollar first name space dollar last name. And then what that'll do is that'll create that string, put it into a backing property or backing field for the name. And then every time you ask it, it's going to get the value of that backing field. So that's one way you could do this. If that's expensive to compute, a backing field is a good option to do that with. Um, in this case, it's not super expensive to compute, so I could have used, I'll call it name one and name two, a getter and define a getter with that same value, just like that. And the difference between these two is that the second guy has no backing field. So he takes up less memory. He doesn't have to store that. But every time you ask for it, it has to recompute that value. So if the value is expensive to compute and it's always going to be the same, a backing field is a good option there. If the value isn't too expensive to compute and you want to save the memory, you can use the getter like this. And in this particular example, this is actually good if the, uh, uh, the, the values that you're deriving this property from are vals. If, let's see, let's put this as a, a separate line there. Only good if properties, pendant properties are vals. And this one is good if dependent properties are vars. So if you can change them, you really have to go this approach so that every time you ask, the value is different. Unless you set it up to every time the values change, you're going to update this other guy. Drive properties can be kind of fun. So let's say that we had a class person 43. And in this particular example, I'm going to have to split out the, uh, I can't use the val format or the var format inside the constructor because I want to override the setters. And so the only way I can do that is I could have first name and last name passed in. Note that those aren't vals or vars. And then inside here, I could define, I'm going to make these vars because they're going to change. First name is a string. <clears throat> 
and last name. And I'm going to have my init block. This dot first name equals first name, last name, last name, something kind of like that. But I also want to have a val full name. Actually, just name is what I wanted to have here, right? And what I want to have this set up is anytime the first name or the last name change, I update name. And that I can do by saying, here's my setter. Say field equals value. And then name equals first name, last name. And then do the same kind of thing. Oh, I had that as a val. I'm going to make that a var. And I'm going to put on this one private set so that from the outside, nobody can change the name. But from the inside, we can. And let's come into here. Field equals value, name equals first name, last name. And is it insisting that I put a, in, hmm, that's interesting. So apparently, if you override the setter, you're still going to explicitly have to set up an initializer, even though we're explicitly initializing these. That's interesting. I don't know if that's a bug or if that's something that is really needed. But anyway, what this is doing, this is a different implementation. of a derived property. Update derived value whenever dependent properties change. Now, it really depends on uh, how often things are going to be called, how complex the initialization is. If the initialization is complex, if this value computation is complex, you're really going to want to go this way. Um, so I'm going to say, this is good if the value is expensive to compute. The derived value is expensive to compute. Um, this particular example, obviously, the first name, last name, it's not expensive to compute that. It would just, we could just go ahead and use this format here every time, and that would be fine. But if that was expensive to compute, you probably only want to change it when the dependent properties, first name and last name, change. Costs you some more code to do that, but you can improve some performance. So if you, know, you do have an expensive operation there, you may want to consider this. Um, but don't optimize prematurely. You know, only come and do this if you really need to, if you find out that this is causing a performance hit in your application. You know, maybe you're calling this name property thousands of times, and you know it could be very expensive to recompute it all those thousands of times. So, questions on that? Okay. So, uh, let's see. Am I? Yeah. So you're going to be doing something kind of similar to this in the assignment, um, where you're going to be creating a derived property. And something like this is probably how you're going to want to implement it. So it's it can just end up uh, computed. How is name being set um, in the person 43 example or 42 with private set alone? So this private set is just saying I'm using the default setter, but it's going to be private. So I'm just changing that. So um, this is actually equivalent to this just by saying private set by itself, it gives you that default setter, but just makes it private. That way it can only be called inside the, inside the class itself. Anybody outside wouldn't be able to change name itself. Does that help? How first name and last name is set for name. Oh, so um, let's take a look at a little example of how this might actually work. Let me get, change that back there. I'm going to make a main in here. And let's create this person 43. 
and I'm going to initialize it to Scott and Stanch field. And then I'm going to do a println on person.name, age, and oops, <laughs> first name and last name. There we go. So first name, last name, age. So I'll print all that out there. Um, Yeah, I mean, normally I'd choose this first one for this example, but just to kind of go through what this one's doing. So what happens is when I end up creating this with the constructor, it's gonna pass in first name and last name, and that's gonna go to this initializer gets run. We're gonna use first name and last name to actually set the first name and last name properties. Because we've overridden these, these uh, setters, Every time these change, I'm going to recompute name. So when I set first name, name is going to become, oh, that's why we need to do initialize these because they both have to be set for this name here. Um, so name is going to become whatever that first name is and then a blank because last name doesn't have a value yet. Then when I set last name, that's going to call his setter. And his setter is going to set name to be whatever the first name was, Scott, plus the last name that we just said, boom. Um, oh, you didn't see that. Gotcha. Cool, cool. Make sense now? Cool. Okay. So um, this is a little bit more complex example of a derived property. You usually don't have to go this far on it. This is usually sufficient to just do something kind of like this. Um, you only really want to think of this other one if that computation is expensive. Okay, questions on that? And it'll also, if I came down here and said person.firstName equals Steve, it'll end up recomputing that as well for that. Um, and again, one of the nice things about Kotlin is because all of your access inside of the class also goes through those getters and setters, it'll have the side effects that we want to have happen. Um, so if inside the class, I actually explicitly set the first name and the last name, it'll trigger those setters to call, which is great. Okay, questions? Now I think I can go back to where I wanted to go. Yes, yeah, so now I've checked that piece off and that piece. Let's do some polymorphism scenarios. This is where things get a little interesting. So I'm gonna define an interface called tool to represent a tool. I'm not putting any properties in there because I don't really care about having extra details about you know functions you can run against a tool or, or properties on a tool. I'm just going to use this as, a, as kind of a handle so that I can pass it around. I can say, here's a tool, and it could be any number type of things. Um, so think of it as just a handle we're attaching to different classes. And I'm going to say I'm going to create a class screwdriver, which is going to be a tool. Note again that I don't have to put parentheses after that because it's not a class. And I'm going to create a saw. So there's a couple tools there. Let's create a toolbox that we can put these in. So we have a toolbox class. And I'm going to keep a little property hidden inside of there. And this is actually going to be one I'm going to hide. I don't want people to have direct access to it. And he's just going to be the list of the tools that we have. Although, you know, actually, it's perfectly fine if somebody sees the list. Let's not let them directly edit it, though. So I'm going to say private set. So tools right now is pointing to an empty list. And if somebody asks for what tools are in the toolbox, they'll see them. But they can't change them from the outside. I'm going to create a little add function in here, passing in a tool. And just so we can keep track of which functions are being called here, I'm going to put in Toolbox, then I do uh, toolbox.add tool. So I'm just going to write the signature of the function just so we can see what's being called when these functions are called. And we're going to say tools equals tools plus tool. So we'll just add them to that list of tools, just like that. Let's define a main to do something here. So inside here, I'm going to create a toolbox 
And for right now, I'm going to use this unnecessary explicit type just so you can see some effects as we go through different scenarios here. Um, that'll become important a little later. I'm going to create a saw. I'm going to have him be type tool. Simple saw. And I'm going to have a screwdriver, which is also going to be a type tool. And let's do a little println here, adding saw to toolbox, and adding screwdriver to toolbox. And then we'll say toolbox dot add saw and screwdriver. So this one, hopefully, will be pretty obvious what's going to happen here. We should see each of these calling this add tool function. So let's go ahead and run this guy. And we'll see here adding saw to toolbox, which called toolbox add tool, adding screwdriver to toolbox, which called toolbox add tool. Worked pretty well, right? So that's one scenario we can work at. Now, what if I define these not as tools, but as, as the actual type of the tools that they are? So if I just came in here, And let's just remove the tool so it derives the type, sorry, infers the type from the right-hand side. So saw is now a subtype saw, screwdriver is of type screwdriver. Let's see what happens there. If I run it, boom, adding saw to toolbox, so we called add tool in add tool. What's happening here is that at compile time, we're taking a look at what type toolbox is and seeing if it has an add that can accept a saw. And similar down here, see if there's an add that can accept a screwdriver. So we look at toolbox and we see this add function and the add function takes a tool. Now, because saw is a tool, that's a match. And it's gonna check to see if there's a more specific match. So if we explicitly defined an add saw, it would choose that over the add tool. But since we only have this one add, that's the one it's gonna see. So at compile time, resolves to add taking a tool. So we just take a look at that, and it keeps a little note in the generated class file saying, I want to call a function add taking a tool, because that's all I know about up here. Then at runtime, oops. We say which type is toolbox really? So what is the actual type? And then look for add taking a tool inside that class. So in this case, toolbox at runtime is actually a toolbox. So we'll look at toolbox, and this is the add tool that we're going to call. So there's two steps to that resolution. Keep that in mind. That's going to make a big difference as we go through this scenario and it gets more complex. Questions so far? This is the easy one. OK, so let's take all this code inside here. And I'm going to put it into scenario two. Just kind of like that. And we're going to change things a little bit here. I'm going to add one more function up here taking a screwdriver. And let's actually just call that tool. And this is going to take him adding a screwdriver. And let's see, is that how I want to do this? Yeah. And let's um, yeah, we'll keep it like this for the moment. Let's see what happens when we run this. Um, we're going to be adding a screwdriver and adding a saw. And what would we expect to be called here? Let's say function A and function B. So in this particular example, when we call add saw, which function do you think is going to be called up there? Anyone? 
So we got an A and that is correct because that's the best match we have for the type of saw, which is a saw. How about when we call add screwdriver? Which one do you think is gonna be called? B, exactly. So uh, that's the best match. In this case, it says there's a more specific match than add tool. So it's gonna call this particular version. So it makes a note of that in compile time for which one is gonna be called. So resolves to, oh, I already did that, resolves to add tool. And then this one here resolves to add screwdriver. And then we're looking for add screwdriver in there. So let's try running this and see what it does just to make sure. And boom, we call add tool, we call add screwdriver. So just like we expected to have happen. Questions on that? Now, what do you think will happen if I swap these around? So let me actually make these two mains here just so it's a little bit more obvious what we got here. And I will do that. And these ones I will undo. Let me just comment him out for the moment. So if I define it this way, where I have uh, my toolbox, this time saw, his compile time type is tool. Screwdriver, his compile time type is tool. Are we gonna have the same calls here? Or what do you think we're gonna resolve to? Any ideas? So keep in mind that add tool is A, add screwdriver is B. So for this first one here, adding a saw, which function should we be, should we be calling? I split this a little bit. So I'll come up here. Here's the definitions up here. So we had add tool, which was A, and add screwdriver, which is B. So in this scenario here, when I call add saw, what compile time type is saw? It's a tool, right? So which function is, looks like it's gonna resolve? Should be A here, so we should get add tool. What's the compile time type of screwdriver? It's also tool here. So we should expect this to actually call A as well. So let's see what happens when we run this. Note that they both call add tool now. And this is something that sometimes trips people up. If you have the compile time type as the super type, you're gonna get the super type one resolved because when it's trying to figure out which function to call, it first has to say at compile time, where do I see uh, that, that, what signature is gonna be the best fit? And if all I know is that it's a tool, the best fit is gonna be tool. And that's something that kind of catches people because we don't have true dynamic resolution on this. There's two phases, the compile time resolution and the runtime resolution. So let's look at another scenario here. Let's say, oh, already did that. Let's see about this one. So this scenario might actually, uh, copy this code, go to scenario three, Actually, I'm gonna skip scenario three because I actually had a scenario three which split those two things up that I just did. Um, so I'm gonna call that scenario four. And I'm gonna just tweak down here. The only thing I'm gonna change is instead of having these be separate definitions, I'm just gonna have a little list called tools to add. It's gonna be a list of the saw and a screwdriver. So the first thing to look at here is what is gonna be the types of the items in that list? 
So we know we have a saw, we know we have a screwdriver. Tools to add can't be a list of saws, it can't be a list of screwdrivers, because then the other one wouldn't be able to be added to the list. So tools to add must be a list of tool. So again, all we know here is that tools to add is list of tool. We don't know what specific types of tools they are. So if now we had here for tool in tools to add, And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the metadata for the tool. It's gonna to take a look at the class definition and then just get the raw name of that. So it's just gonna be saw or screwdriver. Uh, this, if, if, I, if I said instead of simple name, qualified name, it would be the package name, scenario four, dot saw or screwdriver. But I just want just the base name. And then I'm gonna add that tool. So in this particular case, all we know about it at compile time is it resolves to add tool. And then at runtime, we're gonna say which actual time type is the toolbox again and look for add tool. So if we run this guy, again, we'll see them both being added as tool. Okay, questions on that? Does that make some sense so far? It's important to note that Java and Kotlin do not support fully dynamic resolution of the signatures. Uh, now there's some things we can do to get around that, but that's just you know a limitation of the languages themselves. Okay, so let me copy that and go to scenario five. And let's see what I wanna do here. What I'd like to try to do is try to force it to resolve the best thing dynamically. And what I can do here is inside of this guy, I'll first of all, keep that print line where it is, but I'm gonna add a when expression here. I'm gonna say when tool is saw toolbox dot add tool. And when it's screwdriver toolbox add tool else throw I'll just say legal argument exception. Yeah, that one there. No idea what dollar tool colon colon class dot simple name is. And so let's take a look at what this is doing. Notice here that tool has a smart cast on it. It's just noting, noting that that is actually on the, the right hand side of the, the, the arrow here. We, since we know it's a saw, here we know the type is saw. Since we know it's a screwdriver, here we know the type is screwdriver. So this resolves to toolbox, or I guess um, add tool, because that's the best fit we can get. This one resolves to add screwdriver because we actually have a more specific one there. So what we should see is when we add the screwdriver, it should say it's adding the screwdriver. When we say adding the saw, it should say it's adding a tool. So let's try running this one. And there we go. So the saw was first, it says add tool. Screwdriver was second, it says add screwdriver. So what we've done is we've used this when to force the compiler to understand what types these are. And this is a little gross, but there are some cases where you may need this. Um, there was a language that I used a while ago called extend, which worked with another language called Xtext. And it actually had full dynamic resolution, which was really nice. But actually behind the scenes, it was essentially generating code that looked exactly like this that was just checking the types of things and then calling the explicit ones. Because under the scenes, it actually compiled to the JDK, which doesn't have fully dynamic resolution of the signatures. Okay, so take a look at this for a minute here. This guy is a little bit of a problem. It'd be really, really nice if we knew for sure that the only possible types are saw and screwdriver. And looking at the code here, 
yeah, those are the only possible types that we have are saw and screwdriver, right? So there's a nice thing we can do in Kotlin that'll actually take care of that. And let me go ahead and paste that. And what we do is instead of saying just any old interface, we put the word sealed in front of it. And by making something sealed, it limits which subtypes you can create. The only valid subtypes of tool have to exist in the module that we're currently compiling. So when we take a look in this project, we have a single module for this project. So the only possible implementation of tool happened to be inside this whole project. If I created some sub modules in here, so I said new create a module, that's a completely independent compilation unit. And that'll create essentially a jar behind the scenes. And at that level, if we had to find a sealed interface inside that module, then nobody else can create an implementation of that, that uh, sealed interface. And that's pretty darn cool. Because if I just said interface, anybody who uses that common library could create their own tools. But if I want to explicitly limit which things can actually be tools, I can use this sealed interface. And this kind of acts similar to how an enumeration acts, where you have certain fixed sets of values, but it's kind of like enumeration on steroids because you can have multiple instances of each of those subtypes. And each of the subtypes can actually have different fields inside of them. Uh, which is really nice. I mean, we're going to see some uses of this later when we define APIs and have a result type coming through. And the result type could be an error. It could be a object was loaded. It could be just the word loading. And using a sealed interface for that is nice because it locks it in. Nobody can accidentally create an implementation of that tool. So by doing this, if we scroll down, take a look at what happened to our else here. Or else, if we float over it, it's going to say when is exhaustive. So the else is redundant. The compiler is able to look and say, hmm, based on the type of tool up there, there's only two subclasses. And you covered both those bases. Therefore, you don't need this. So I can just go ahead and delete that guy. And that's really nice having this exhaustive when here and not having to always have this else clause that says, I don't know. And you've probably had several programs where you've had a switch statement or some other statement similar where you have to have an else on there, which is never going to get hit because your code never defines something like that. You know, there aren't any other possibilities. So this limits which possibilities there are. Now, of course, if I came up here and said class all is a tool, I now have more tools. So now that when is no longer exhaustive. And if I float over him up here, he's going to say non-exhaustive when on a sealed class. Oh, it'll be prohibited in one seven. Ooh, nice. I like that. Um, obviously, they put this uh, little note in here later on. Um, that's fantastic. I like that. So it's catching that. Um, the uh, That's not going to apply anymore. But I thought there was a way to mark it explicitly as exhaustive. Well, if I hit uh, Alt-Enter on there, I can add remaining branches, and it'll add a branch for that all there. I'm going to go ahead and delete that and delete the all up there. Uh, but those are pretty nice there. OK. Don't worry about these uh, squiggles where it says sealed subclasses, no state. We're not going to worry about that for the moment. I'm going to come back and talk about that later. Um, but maybe if we put like a name property on these, you know, it could be a named screwdriver because I always name all of my tools. Yeah, right. Uh, let's go ahead and try running this. Boom, adding tool, adding screwdriver, just like we saw before. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, whoops. And we want to go to scenario seven. Come up there. And so the next thing we're going to do is let's create a subtype toolbox. And I want to subtype a toolbox that is going to be a safe toolbox. If you per put certain types of tools in there, 
it automatically wraps them so that you can't cut your hand. So if you put a saw in there, for example, it'll automatically wrap that saw up or do something like that so that you won't cut yourself when you pull it out. And then when you go to pull it out, it'll magically unwrap it as you pull it out. So first thing we're going to do if we want to create a subtype of this is make it open. Then we can come in here and say class safe toolbox is going to be a toolbox. And then let's tweak things a little bit. Let's come in here and say fun add saw colon saw. And then in here, what I'm going to do, let's put that println. I'm going to say safe toolbox add saw. And I'm just going to call super.add saw, just like that. Now let's think about what this guy is doing. When I call super.add, his choices are going to be either A or B. Which function should be called based on this super.add call? Is it going to call add passing a tool or add passing a screwdriver? A or B? Any ideas, any guesses? What do we know about this? We know that saw is a saw, right? Is there an ad taking a saw? Nope. What's the next possible thing? I can go up the hierarchy of saw to tool. There's an ad taking tool. So it's gonna end up calling A. So here it makes a note that it wants to call ad taking a tool. Okay, so we have our safe toolbox. Let's create a val safe toolbox equals safe toolbox. And actually, I don't think I need the toolbox anymore. And I can come into here, adding that to the safe toolbox. And I'll say safe toolbox there safe toolbox there. And let's think about what is happening on these guys now. So at, com at compile time, what's it going to resolve to for each of these? Let's see, compile. Let's see what signature these will go. So when we say safe toolbox add tool, well, in this case, we know the tool is a saw. What's the actual type of safe toolbox here? And actually, let me force this to be a toolbox for, to start with. So what we're saying is we're saying safe toolbox, all we know about it at compile time is that it's a toolbox. Based on that, we're going to have to take a look at toolbox to see where saw and screwdriver go. So saw would end up calling add tool. So at compile time, we resolve add passing in tool. And then down here, screwdriver. We have a screwdriver up here. At compile time, we make a note that add screwdriver. And then what we're going to do is at runtime see which toolbox we really have. Do we have a normal toolbox or do we have a safe toolbox? And then locate each of these signatures inside of them. So when we run this, we're actually going to see these two functions called. Let's try running that. So we see toolbox add tool, toolbox add screwdriver. Boom. We didn't have add saw called because add saw is not defined at the toolbox level. If we change the compile time type of this guy, actually, whoops. Let's do, let's see, did I have that as the next step over here? What's the difference between those two? Um, oh, okay, yeah, that's the next step. So I will take all the code in here. We'll go into scenario eight. 
And let's just change the compile time type of Safe Toolbox. Now that we've done that, we know here that Safe Toolbox at compile time is a Safe Toolbox. So we can actually look at this function as well as the functions that are inherited from the superclass. So we'll see here that if it's a saw, we're going to see add saw as a possibility now. Boom, just like that. Here, we see it's a screwdriver. We see add screwdriver as a possibility because it's inherited. And so now if we run it, it's actually going to look more like we, what we expected. Note that it's calling safe toolbox add first and then calling that super class to actually do the toolbox add tool. So this is probably doing more like we want. Now, what this really means is that if you have a bunch of types that you want to overload. So in this case, we want to have a bunch of overloads for add, tool, screwdriver, and so on. You need the super class to have overrides for all, or sorry, overloads for all of them just for the type resolution. So if I came up in here and I said, Add taking a saw. I'll call that C. Oops, I wanted to call that a tool there. Now notice that this guy is also saying you have to override that. So this one I'm gonna have to make open and then add the override modifier on him. And little thing that it's doing here, note that it's it's highlighting this saying the parameter isn't the same name. And I actually like this lint check. Uh, it's something that sometimes the parameter name can be confusing if it's different between the override. It doesn't actually affect the, the way it runs or the way it compiles, but it's actually a nice thing to have that synced so that when you're reading the code, you're actually thinking the same way in both functions. So if I right click on this guy and say refactor, rename. I'll just change that to tool. It's going to change it in both places. And now that little warning goes away. So that's actually pretty nice. Um, so this is actually going to call C, the super class one up here. This will now work if I declare this as type toolbox. Because what's going to happen is that at compile time, all we're caring about is the signature of the functions. So it's going to say add saw is what I want. Then at runtime, it's going to say, well, what really is safe toolbox? What type is it? And at that point, it's going to say it's a safe toolbox. And it's going to say, does the signature that I figured out at compile time exist at the real class definition level? So I'll actually see this one. This one, it's actually seeing from toolbox. I'll say resolved from toolbox. So at runtime, it's actually going to see safe toolbox dot add saw. And then this one here, this is again resolved from toolbox because that's the compile time type. And then at runtime, we're actually going to call the toolbox.add screwdriver because we don't actually have one overridden in safe toolbox. So let's run this and see if that does what we think it's going to do. There we go. So safe toolbox add was called there. Toolbox add was called down here. Make some sense? I know we got a little into the weeds on this, um, but I like to go through this example because it's not really super obvious. And you know, this example is a little on the contrived side, but there are plenty of times when this type of scenario is going to happen. And kind of the, the gut feel is, oh, I'll just add an override in the subclass. And the superclass didn't get that override. Oh, sorry. Oh, the, the superclass didn't get that overload. Um, yeah, getting override versus overload, make sure I'm saying it right. Overload is different signatures with the same name.
Um, so sometimes people will add an overload in the subclass, but because the thing you're using to, at compile time to point to the type is of the superclass type, it's just going to completely ignore it. So this is one of those things you got to be a little careful of. Uh, and you're not going to come across this scenario every day, but at some point it's going to hit you and you're going to remember this lecture. At least that's my hope. Um, or if you're in an interviewing for a job at some point, somebody might ask you something like this. How does the resolution work in, in Java or Kotlin? And just keep in mind, it's a two-step resolution. First of all, what is the compile type of the receiver here? In this case, it's toolbox. And then from there, we look up the signature and only remember the signature. Then at runtime, we say, well, what really is that? And look up to see, do I have that signature in that class? If not, look in the super class, look in the super class, look in the super class, and so on. Make some sense? Any questions on that? OK, so one more little thing. I'm going to add in another guy up here. Whoops, do a new Kotlin file. And let's say, really cool little thing that they have in Kotlin, and they added this in Java fairly recently as well, is default implementations of functions inside an interface. Let's say, for example, that we had an interface that represented a, well, let's say that, uh, let's say named entity. And maybe this named entity has a first name and a last name. So we'll say val first name and last name. And these are abstract because everything in the, in the interface is normally abstract, uh, which means that anybody who implements named entity has to implement those uh, those two guy uh, those two properties. So if I had a class person fifty five who is going to be a named entity, I can implement those as constructor parameters. Boom, and I'm just going to split these out. Now we've actually implemented those explicitly inside the subtype. But let's say that we wanted to have a derived name and the name is always gonna be first name, last name. We could do something kind of like this. And then down here, he's gonna have val name, which is gonna be a string. And we say git equals dollar first name, dollar last name. And I need to override that. But the problem here is that every time we implement this, somebody has to re-implement that name. And maybe we always want it to be first name, last name. And basically they're gonna write the exact same code in every subclass. And there's a chance somebody could screw that up. So instead of doing it this way, what we can do is let's just go ahead and copy that and comment them out. We can define a default implementation of that property up here. So I can say git equals, whoops, that. And these default implementations are real implementations that get sucked into the subtypes. They can only reference other things inside the interface. But that's pretty cool because now I can define this once and down here, I don't have to explicitly override those. I inherit that implementation and name and then they'll both get that. Now they could implement first name and last name differently so maybe I have these just, um, whoops, not in the constructor. And what is not happy there? 
I put it in the wrong spot there. There we go. I just left it down there. So here I'm implementing them as just properties that aren't in a constructor at all. So you'd have to explicitly set them separately. And here I put them as a, uh, a proper as constructor parameters for the primary constructor. But in either case, I get the same behavior out of that name. So these can be implemented differently. This guy, I can just inherit that. But I can also override it. So if somebody wanted to, let's say that I, I said uh, doctor. And then I can override the name to say doctor, first name, last name, something kind of like that. So you have that option of implementing it, or you can just leave it as a default. And that can be really, really useful. So if you have, you know, especially derived properties like this, could be a function as well. So we could have a fun print hello. And then, oops, what did I hit? Printlin hello. So that could be the default of that as well. And any one of these guys can call print hello and get that default implementation. If somebody wants to override it, they can. So maybe he wants to say print hello. And he says, greetings and salutations, something kind of like that. So it gives you an option to kind of pull things in. And this starts to lead into being able to do some mix-in capability. So you can actually inherit from multiple things various implementations. So if you define the varying parts in the interface as either abstract values or abstract functions, and the actual common code that you want to implement as default, default parameters and default uh, properties, you can do some real mix-in support. Whereas you know, in Java or Kotlin, you normally can't have one, more than one superclass. But now you can put some of this actually inside interfaces. And that's really super powerful. So uh, something to think about. You might find that useful at some point. Um, any questions on that? OK, and finally, one other little thing. I'll just create one more here called sealed. We talked about sealed, sealed interfaces before. Um, well, yeah, I'll say mammal, why not? Um, and then I have, uh, oh, I already have a mammal in there. That's why it's not liking it. Let's say um, car is a sealed interface. And then we have some class, uh, let's say CRV, I'll take my car, is a car. And class RAV4 is a car, maybe something kind of like that. So we could do something like this with a sealed interface. But sometimes it's actually useful to have some data inside that top level. So instead of a sealed interface, you could also have a sealed class. And he might have some information in there, like um, the maker. And so then we could define a class CRV2, which is a car2. Add that constructor parameter. Well, in this case, we know that where the CR, what who makes the CRV. So I can just explicitly say Honda in there. And then maybe the RAV4. I could say Toyota in there. RAV4 too. <laughs> all the silly stuff with the names. Um, so we could explicitly put that in. So you can actually have the uh, sealed class be an actual class as opposed to just an interface like we had before. OK. And I don't think I have time to go into this other thing. I think I'll start off next week with objects. We'll see how that goes. Any questions on anything we've covered today? Okay, well, if you have questions, we can stick around a little bit longer. Otherwise,
we will call it a class and I will post the assignment very shortly. Uh, the assignment is going to be uh, creating some classes and subclasses. Um, yeah, I'm just taking a look at it right now here. I've just got to make a few tweaks of it. Uh, and uh, should be fairly straightforward. Um, some of it is using functions inside a class. So keep in mind that you can use functions in a class the same way that we use them outside of a class. Uh, in particular, you're going to have to pass in a uh, lambda to one of the one of the uh, functions that's inside of a class. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to post on the forums or send me an email. Otherwise, have a wonderful week.